Well, today is a wonderful, amazing, awesome, beautiful, exciting day. Uh, if you didn't know, you're in a Baptist church, right? <laughs> and if it was important enough that we chose to put it on the front of the building as an identifier, then we should be excited about baptisms, right? We should be excited. We get to rejoice. We get to celebrate. I'm excited. I'm excited enough for you, even if you aren't. I'm excited, okay? So following uh, the time we have gathered here, just so you know what's going on, worship isn't done when I stop talking, okay? We're going to have uh, Carrie and Aaron come forward later on at the end, and they'll, they'll share their personal story. Uh, they, they shared last weekend with our deacons, and boy, powerful, beautiful, beautiful story of the work of Jesus in their lives. And when they're done, and I'll be up here with them, I won't make them stand up here alone, but uh, when we're done... We're just going to wind our way right outside the building. If you could have x-ray vision like Superman and look through the building, there's a pool right out here. And thank you, Raleigh, for filling it and making sure. He was bringing five-gallon pails of hot water out to it this morning. I'm not kidding. When I showed up, he was carrying pails of hot water to heat up the pool out there. Okay? And so we've got a pool. We're going to do two baptisms. We'll go out there. We're going to rejoice. We're going to celebrate. It's going to be awesome. And then after we do the baptisms, we'll close with a verse of amazing grace and you'll understand that when we get out there. So I'm excited to do this, and I'm excited to be here, and I hope you are too. Now, when it comes to baptism, I, I don't want to make any assumptions about baptism because people are all over the place in their understanding of what baptism is. And so because of that, I'm going to just give an overview. This is going to be a little bit different than the way I might normally preach a sermon. If you look at our sermons online, you'll see I preach a little bit differently than I do today. Today is going to be a little bit more informational and lection, or lectional, or I don't know if that's a word. I'm going to lecture you a little bit more about what we believe baptism is and what it means and why we do it and all those things. And so uh, saddle up and let's go, I guess, right? Um, it's an exciting thing that um, we get to do this, and I'm excited that I get to share this opportunity with you. And so I just want to teach a little bit on baptism today. And so the first question, you can see the outline in your uh, sermon notes. You don't have to take notes today unless you want to. But the first thing there is, well, what is baptism, right? I, I want to be fundamentally clear on what baptism is. What baptism is. What is it? And, and for me, the, the place that comes to mind, the first go-to is the Apostle Paul. And, and in Romans 6, 3 through 6, it says this. It says, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, right? So all of us, everyone who's been baptized, um, the thing that Paul is saying here is the first thing is baptism is about Jesus, right? And if we pause right there, baptism is about Jesus. And when we come and next week, uh, we have communion. The first Sunday of the month, we do communion. When we come together as a church for communion, Communion is all about Jesus' broken body, his shed blood, his death on the cross for our sins, right? And, and that is an outward showing of this in, inward sort of blessing that Jesus has given us. And then when we do baptism like we're going to do today, we get to show Jesus' resurrection. So this is all about Jesus, about his death, his burial, and his resurrection for our sins. And it's a, a beautiful depiction. We see that as, as we go into the water and we rise as Jesus rose from the grave. As we come up out of the water, it's a beautiful imagery. And, and along with that, baptism it shows us that we are connected with Jesus. And it shows that we are also connected with the church. So when we see people get baptized... It's all of us who've been baptized before. All of us as God's people. All of us coming together as ones who've walked that path together, celebrating and rejoicing with one another. Now, of course, there's many denominations and many traditions that go along with this, but the big idea I want you to hear is that for 2,000 plus years, the church has been celebrating in this way. The church has been celebrating baptism, if you've studied your New Testament, Jesus himself was baptized. And it doesn't matter what your race, your nationality, what your church-going history, or any of that kind of stuff. None of that matters when it comes to baptism. We are all God's children. We all come together. We all can be baptized in the same way. So, so this is a beautiful thing, and it's available for all who want it. So for us... As it says, all of us who have been baptized, 
into Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, one of the reasons we baptize people in the church is it glorifies God, right? But we also believe that there's a, a blessing and a benefit to the person themselves who are being baptized. I, I could tell you my own story. I'm not going to today, but I could tell you my own story about being baptized and what a tremendous blessing that was. And, and I know many of you in this room today could as well. And, and I remember that day when I was baptized. It was a, a momentous day in my life, a, a day that I will never, ever forget. I, I could tell you details about that day that will never leave my brain. I can't remember most days of my life, but boy, that hour of worship, that day where I was baptized, the pastor who baptized me, the things that he said, the, the look of joy in his face when he brought me down in the water and brought me back out and said, you're the biggest guy I've ever dunked underwater. <laughs> and there was, we, we, had a, we had a big hole in the stage with a drop-down baptismal fountain, and there was a tidal wave when he dropped me, <laughs> right? It was, the, you know, we're supposed to cheer. The place laughed and then cheered after I was baptized. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, it is what it is. But... Uh, it's awesome. It's fun. It's exciting. And here today, I wanted to do the baptisms here. And now, it's okay. It's awesome to do baptisms elsewhere. You know, people go to Israel and get baptized in the Jordan River. Awesome. People get baptized in the lakes up here and in the rivers up here. Awesome. You know, people get baptized in all sorts of bodies of water, pools and other things. But specifically today, I wanted to do the baptisms here, and Carrie and Aaron were cool with this, because that means we all get to go outside and be part of it as a church and rejoice and celebrate, because what always happens, even if we just drive down the road a mile, we'll lose some people, right? And then they miss out on that just excitement and passion and joy. So today, when we're done in here, we're going to go outside and cheer, all right? It's, it's okay to cheer and to make noise and to rejoice and to lift your hands and hug and Get all sapping wet and those kinds of things. It's okay. Congratulate people and, and rejoice, right? It's important enough we put it on the building. We're Baptists. We should celebrate it. So there's an amazing personal blessing that comes from being baptized. And, and I count myself blessed. Thank you, Carrie and Aaron, for letting me be part of this day with you. And then Paul goes on to explain here in Romans that we were buried, therefore, with him, with Jesus by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk with newness of life. So again, here's what baptism's about. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and then Jesus rose from death. And it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we see in this. And that's exactly what Paul says here. And that's why when we baptize somebody, we're saying that Jesus has died for them. That Jesus was buried for them. That Jesus has rose for them. And that Jesus loves them. And then what they are saying is that they, in return, love Jesus as well. That's the act of baptism. That's what we're saying. When I was baptized, and, and uh, Carrie and Aaron last week, when they were deciding this was what they were going to do, they sat down with our deacons and they shared their faith story. They said, yeah, this is important to me. I follow Jesus. I'm not ashamed of it. And I want to be public about it. And that's a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing. They agreed that, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for me, that he was buried and he rose again. And, and that only if I put my hope and trust in him, if my faith is in him, my salvation comes from the Lord. And then, Paul, in this passage, he goes on to say this, and he says, For if we have been united with Jesus in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So in these benefits and blessings, these benefits and blessings that come from knowing Jesus and living for Jesus and following Jesus and putting our hope and trust in Jesus, in that comes the forgiveness of sin and then there's that eternal blessing and those eternal benefits that come along with that, that just as Jesus died and rose again, so too will we who follow him. And so, as I said, what we're showing in baptism is this beautiful picture, this recreation, so to speak, of the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, there will, of course, come a day. We see this in places like Daniel 12, that talks about when 
multitudes who are asleep and are dust of the earth, when they will arise, the day of the second coming of Jesus, Jesus who is alive right now in heaven. And on that day, we who are in Christ will all resurrect together. We will rise from death just like Jesus did. And in baptism, that's what we're showing. All of us know we're going to die. Life is terminal, right? That day is coming for you and for me, for every one of us. We don't know when it is. So the best we can do is prepare and be ready. But because of that, if we do that, if our hope and trust is in Jesus, that's not the end. In fact, this is only the beginning, in fact, right? This is eternity we're talking about. And the time we spend here, that's just a tiny little blip. Not an insignificant blip, but a tiny little span in the bigger scheme of things. And what Jesus does is he utterly transforms all of it. He gives us hope beyond the grave. He gives us reason to rejoice when others go before us, knowing that when we too pass from this earth, we will not be alone. In fact, we will be with the many, and we will be rejoicing. I love studying about heaven. I do. It's so encouraging. I mean, I don't want to die. I got a wife. I got a son. I got family here today. I, you're all my family too. I enjoy my job. I love living in the North Woods. Even when it rains like you've never seen before like yesterday. <laughs> Holy smokes, my backyard flooded. I got a new house, so I'm learning things about it. And all that's good and all that's great. But all of that... It's just a foretaste of the feast that is to come, right? I mean, that's like just a little, little dab of the honey. You taste, oh, I think that was a little sweetness, right? You ever put a little dot of honey on your tongue? Hmm. That was nice. But heaven, oh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be this Endless feast. Like we can't even imagine. I love studying heaven, like I said. I love when I go to Revelation, and I'm way off script, and I'm sorry, Ruth, but that's okay. Or, well, Sandy. <laughs> when we study heaven. When we read what John writes about heaven in Revelation, he describes heaven. John uses some really cool words. He talks about just the beauty, the splendor. He uses terms of rubies and diamonds and emeralds and gold and all those sorts of things. Cerulean. How many knew what cerulean is? It's a hard gemstone. I've never seen one that I know of. But John talks about it, right? And I think when we get to heaven, rather than showing up in heaven and going, oh, look, gold and diamonds and rubies and silver and, and those sorts of things, instead what we're going to find is John was tasked with the impossible. God said, John, I'm going to give you a vision of heaven. And you've got to describe this. John, I'm going to show you something that nobody's seen that's beyond words. And you get the task, John, of having to tell people about it. How many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? Right? Now, most of us who go to the Grand Canyon... Right? We take a picture of it. How many photos have ever done justice of what you experienced standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon? Never one. Right? When you get there, I've been to the Grand Canyon a couple of times, and you walk up, hopefully there's a fence. There's places there aren't. Right? You get your toes up there. You look, and you look, and you look. Words cannot capture that. You stand there in awe of what God has created. When we get to heaven, it's going to be that, but so much more amazingness. And in baptism, we get to see uh, just a little taste of that. And that's why we celebrate and rejoice. Because we know that this 
imagery, death, burial, and resurrection coming up out of the water and rising again is a reminder that we will rise again and that we as God's people will rejoice and celebrate for all of eternity. We have hope that goes beyond the grave, folks. That is awesome. That excites me. Hopefully, it excites you. Because it's powerful, folks. Now in that, we see this beautiful story that Jesus has written for us. The story about sin. And we need to be clear. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We are broken. We are flawed. We have failed. We have faults. Pastors included. Especially pastors. Right? We do. We'll be honest about that. We've lived a life of disobedience. Our, our natural default state as humans is rebellion. If you ever had any doubt about the inherent sinfulness of man, all you have to do is raise a young child. I didn't have to teach my son how to disobey. I didn't have to teach my son any of the bad things that he's done in his life. He picked those up on his own. He figured out how to be rebellious on his own, as did we. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is that we have the gospel. The good news is that God doesn't leave us alone in our sin. The good news is that God loves us radically. So much so that he sent his one and only son to die upon the cross that whomsoever might believe in him shall inherit eternal life. Jesus came into the world not to condemn us, but to free us. And in baptism, we get to see a beautiful little picture of that freedom. And because of Jesus' death, he put our sins to death. Whatever may have ensnared you, enslaved you, we who follow Jesus get the opportunity to walk away from it just as Jesus walked away from the grave. What an awesome opportunity. And when Paul uses this language, we see this in the New Testament in a number of places, he talks about being enslaved. Paul frequently calls himself a doulos, a slave or a servant, if you study the Greek. And he uses this terminology very frequently, this terminology of slavery and, and This idea that we are in bondage. Now, when Paul speaks about being in bondage himself, it means he's in bondage to Jesus, and that's a good thing. But Paul also uses the language about us being in bondage to sin. The world is filled with all kinds of problems. The world is not the way God intended it to be, right? And it's been that way since Adam and Eve. Since the first sin, the world has struggled and been broken. Lies, addiction, betrayal, pride, sin. We're good at making a mess out of things, right? We're just naturally inclined. And as we give way to those sins in our lives, they get a grip of us. They get a hold of us. Right? Nobody ever says the first time they do something that they want to be an addict. That's never somebody's intent. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, whatever, pornography, take your pick. Many things can ensnare us. Nobody looks at something and says, I want that to addict me and I want that to take all my money and I want that to ruin my life and I may want that to ruin my health. That looks like a good way to go with life. Right? But sin ensnares us that way. It grabs us and it subtly works its way into our lives. And it gets into every little nook and cranny and corner. And the problem is, we can't root it out on our own. We don't have some sort of magical spiritual roundup we can just spray on ourselves and make it go away. It would be easy if we did. You know, wash, wash those sins off. Okay, I'm good for another day. That's, that's not what happens, though. But... God provided us a way out again. And again, that is what baptism is showing. 
Jesus came to remove that stain, the stain of our sin, so that when our God, our Father in heaven sees us, he doesn't see that time I stole, I lied, I cheated, I did wrong. He doesn't see that time where I didn't help when I could have helped. He doesn't see that time where I had pride or that time where I was selfish or that time where, boy, I sure could have been generous, but I wasn't. He doesn't see that time where I should have forgiven, but I was angry. I didn't want to forgive. He doesn't see all that mess. Instead, what God sees when he looks upon me is Jesus, because I've been washed clean, spotless, perfect, beautiful. And so as we celebrate baptism, that is the imagery. And that's why we are so excited, because that is good news. So then the second question is, how is it that we baptize? How do we baptize? Well, as we look through the New Testament, as we dig into it, um, and, and I've done this study, okay? Just a, a bit of personal background. I was born, baptized, confirmed, never missed hardly a Sunday in my life growing up in a Lutheran church. Baptized when I was an infant. Okay? So, for the first 20 some years of my life, even after I became a Christian, that's where my theological ideas came from. Now, I didn't become a Christian until I was in college. That's through no fault of my parents, they did their part. Through no fault of my church, they did their part. I had amazing Sunday school teachers, they did their part. I had great Christian friends. In fact, growing up, one of my best friend's dad was the president of the seminary in Sioux Falls. So it wasn't like God didn't put people in my life, right? It wasn't their fault. I was hard-hearted. The gospel hadn't penetrated my heart. I knew there was a God, but I hadn't made things right with Jesus. I didn't understand who Jesus was and that he had died for my sin. And so it took a while. And then I got to start going to some churches as I became a Christian. And I started to examine what it means to be baptized. And as I dug into it and as I come into an understanding, as I studied it, slowly but surely God kind of shifted me over to where we as Baptists practice what's called a credo baptism, that we baptize people upon profession of faith rather than a pedo baptism that baptizes infants. So many years after I'd been baptized as an infant, I finally said, you know what? Having studied this, having looked into the word, having studied the Greek word baptizo, what that means, and we can dig into that some other time if you want to know more about that. I, mean, I, wrote, I wrote a whole paper on it in seminary, right? We can dig into that some other time. But having dug into that, having looked at that, slowly but surely God kind of moved that theological needle for me over to where I find myself today. Where where I see the beauty of going into a body of water and dying and rising again. Where, where I see myself going out into the pool as Jesus went down into the river, Jordan. John the baptizer was standing there and we, we see the story in Mark 1.5. John is, is standing down in the river Jordan in modern day Israel. He's standing there in the River Jordan baptizing people after they have confessed and repented of their faith, of their sins for faith. And so Jesus and his band of Mary followers come walking upon him and come walking up and see John down there and Jesus says, all right, I'm going to do this too. Jesus goes down into the river. John takes him down into the water and brings him up again. Was Jesus a sinner? No, he wasn't. But Jesus was modeling for us, showing us the way. So that's why we celebrate it in that way here. That and a number of other things, but that's one of the primary reasons is this beautiful imagery that we get to, just as Jesus did, go down into the water. There's lots of other places in the New Testament where we see this Philip and the eunuch and many, many places where we see people going down into the water and being baptized. And then we see in lots of other places this pattern where people repent and then are baptized. We, we see Peter in one of the very first sermons ever preached in the New Testament church. This is on the day of Pentecost. 
He tells the people. They've been speaking in tongues, right? They had flames of fire above their head. And the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples. And this amazing thing happens. And they, they start speaking in tongues. And people all over start hearing their word in a language they're familiar with. A language that the disciples normally otherwise couldn't speak. And they're drawn in. And Peter that day preaches. And the people are like, well, what should we do? We, we, want what you, we, want, we want to experience what, what you have. We want this. Peter says, repent and be baptized. And they were. And many were added to their number that day. We see 3,000. And then a little bit while later, we've just been studying this in our Wednesday Bible study. We're working our way through the book of Acts. Just a few days later, we see it goes from 3,000 being added in one day. And, and a few days later, all of a sudden, it's 5,000 men are already following Christ. The church explodes as people repent and baptize. There's power in that. And so that's why we do it like we do it. Beautiful, beautiful imagery. And the last thing I want to talk about today is why is it that we baptize? Well, I kind of touched on that a little moment ago. It's an act of obedience. Jesus says, final command before he goes to the cross. We get this Matthew 28, 19. You probably memorize this as one of the first scripture verses. If you ever went to Sunday school or if you ever went to VBS, you know this verse. Jesus says, therefore. And the therefore, what's the therefore, right? He's giving us a command. He's telling us that we need to do this. He says, if you're following me, and you want to be like me? You want to be on my team? If that's what you want, therefore, go. Go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. That means in your backyard, in Aiken, in Aiken County, in Minnesota, in the United States, and then to the ends of the earth. Everywhere. All nations. Go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen, right? The Trinity. We see that Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Jesus' own baptism, right? We see Jesus, he goes down into the water. We see God in heavens who says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And we see the Holy Spirit descend as a dove upon Jesus at his baptism. So when we baptize, and we'll do this today, I will tell Carrie and Aaron, it is my joy to baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we baptize as an act of obedience because Jesus told us to and Jesus showed us himself by being baptized himself that this is something worth our time. Now not only did Jesus teach this and preach this, his disciples did as well. As I said and this is what I was touching on before, Peter says the same thing. He says, repent and be baptized. We see this all over the New Testament. Repent and be baptized. And the final thing that I'm going to point out is, who do we baptize? Well, I touched on this a little bit earlier. But the key for us as Baptists is we repent and we then get baptized. And for us that means a profession of faith of some sort. Somebody saying that I follow Jesus, I've put my hope and trust in him for my salvation and I want to make a public proclamation. I want to speak outwardly about this inward change, this transformation that Jesus is working in my life. It doesn't mean that we've arrived. It doesn't mean that all of our problems have gone away. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're no longer sinners. Nope. Make no mistake. When I baptize Carrie and Aaron, they're still going to sin. We are all hypocrites. We are all broken. We are failures. But more important than any of that, we are all forgiven if we put our hope and trust in Jesus. That is the important thing. So who do we baptize? We baptize the forgiven, those who've put their trust in Christ. Baptism isn't a get-into-heaven-free card. 
Now, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to do some business with Jesus. The Bible's clear about that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. He doesn't say, and baptism. He doesn't say, and good works. He doesn't say, and giving big piles of money. Uh-uh. It's in relationship with me. That's how we get into heaven. And the good thing about that is, that means all of us qualify. All of us, every one of us, everyone who's hearing my voice today, anyone who listened to this message in the future, can put their hope and trust in Jesus and know that he is with them for all of eternity. We rejoice in that today. Let us pray. Lord God, you are good. Good beyond measure. Good beyond anything we ever deserve. And you have blessed us in an infinite and amazing way that far exceeds anything we could even ask for or expect. God, today we pray a special prayer specifically for this beautiful husband and wife, this couple that you have brought together. We pray for them and their children, their energetic, rambunctious, beautiful boys. We pray for that beautiful child that you're knitting right now in Kerry. We celebrate this transformational choice that they've made in their lives to follow after you. What a beautiful thing that is. And so God, may your blessing be upon them as we as a church come alongside them. May we be encouragers. May we equip them. May we lift them up and support them in whatever ways that we can. That they may grow in faith. That they may follow after you each and every day of their lives. That they may equip their children to follow after you as well, Lord. God, we're thankful for this church. We're thankful for all the people who've come before us that make this possible. You have indeed been generous to us. So we rejoice and are glad in it. And God, today, if anyone is here who's just not made that commitment in their lives to you previously, Lord, I just pray that they would be burdened, that they would be clear that they need to make things right with you and repent, that they need to know that you love them more than they will ever know, and that they can be forgiven, and that they can be freed from their sins. And God, if somebody's here today and they want that, just pray, God, that right now they would do that business with you, that they would come before you, Lord, and just say, God, I've sinned, I've fallen short of your glory. I'm broken, and I need you because I cannot fix this myself. And so if that's the case, then I repent of my sin, Lord. I place it before you at the foot of the cross. Take it from me and put your righteousness upon me that I too may inherit eternal life. If you've done that today, we rejoice with you and we celebrate with you because your eternity is now changed. You've joined the rest of us who have hope beyond the grave because of Jesus. We thank you for that. Jesus, we love you, and indeed we praise you. Amen. Carrie and Aaron, if you want to come on up, I'm going to find the microphone. Oh, they've got them. Well, and I don't have to do it. Originally, Carrie and Aaron were going to do videotapes, and we were going to show you their testimony. I was going to go to their house and I was going to record it and that's the easy way out, right? And then Carrie said, you know, I think we're going to come up on stage with you and do it. So let's give them a round of applause for being brave. Make sure you, let's make sure these are on. There you go. It's yours on as well. There you go. You're both on. Well, with that, Aaron, you want to go first? Okay. This is, this is Aaron Moss and Carrie Moss. Their boys, I think, are in the nursery, and uh, we're excited to have you. So I'll stay up here with you guys. If you need help or anything, let me know, but you can tell your story. This is their testimony in their own words, so. Uh, hey, everybody. My name's Aaron, like you said. Um, 
I'll just tell you a little bit about myself before I go on with any sort of story. Um, so I grew up in Hill City on a farm way back in the middle of the woods, so I never really had a, the transportation really to go to church when I was a kid or really all the way up until I was 16 when I could drive myself. Um, I drove all the way to Grand Rapids from Hill City to go to a youth group. I started doing that for, I did it since I was in, since I was 16 until I graduated. Um, and I was never able to go to church as a kid, like I said, and to, to learn more about Jesus. But at a youth group, I ended up getting into the music and, and, and seeing all the friends and learning more about Jesus as I was going there. And it, it just, I just liked it. I don't know. It, it, it was awesome. Um, so I met my wife. We, um, we pretty much have been going to church ever since we started dating. Uh, and she has been a big factor in, in the fact that I've learned more because of her. Um, so I, I didn't write down a speech because I procrast procrastinate all the time, and I, I, would, I would not do good about that. So hopefully this is good enough. Um, I really think that being baptized would be an amazing step, a big step for our family, for our kids. They would see it, you know, well, they wouldn't see it personally because they're not here. Um, I got my two little ones are in the daycare right now, and they're beautiful little little boys. And I think when they grow up, they're going to be encouraged by this to even do it themselves to follow Jesus more. And I think that's very important. And I feel that that's going to be something amazing to see. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a little, a little bit, a little story. My my youngest or my second youngest, Matthew. His name's Matthew. We, we pray all the time at dinner. You know, we grab hands and everything. And if we, if we forget to do something, he'll grab someone's hand and he'll close his eyes and he'll start whispering. He's only uh, two now? He's two, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so he, he, would, he would sit there and he would whisper. He would grab hands and he would just whisper. And then at the end, he would clap. And I feel like that's another thing, like he's watching everything we do. And I believe that yeah. they're gonna be in, they're gonna do better than we did actually because of what we're doing. Um, that's about all I got, I guess. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Well here's my wife. <laughs> Give her support. Yeah, yeah, come right up here. Yes, yes, you can. Here, I'll just throw all this under here. I'm Carrie. Um, Before she gets too far, she almost brought me to tears last week, so get ready. <laughs> um, I will be 26 next month, and there was never a time in my life that I didn't know who God was. I went to church and Sunday school as a child, and I spent most summers going to Bible camp. I knew the Bible stories, and I knew Jesus loved me, but I didn't actually know what that meant. I accepted Jesus as my Savior early in my teen years and asked him to come into my life, forgive my sins. But I would describe my relationship with Jesus as mediocre. And I still went through my life with an uncertainty and a doubt that I was really forgiven. I believed, but only years later when I fully surrendered my life would I find my way and receive my new life. About six months ago, I experienced love in a way that changed my heart forever. It was sudden, simple, and yet incredibly powerful. Matthew 5:24 says, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and make peace with your brother, then come back and offer your gift. 
And unbeknownst to me, that verse would become a life bulb to my soul. I was sitting in a church service about to partake in communion, and the pastor said a few words about forgiveness. And it hit me so suddenly, and all at once I finally understood. It was so simple yet so powerful, I sat there and bowed my head, closed my eyes, and silently started to forgive the people I had harbored pain from for years. But it didn't end there. The Lord brought me more names to me, some I didn't even realize I needed to forgive. I felt like a brand new person after that moment. Like my eyes had been open. My heart and soul became on fire for the Lord, for the word, for a relationship with my creator. I had found something that I that I was made new, not by anything I had done or hadn't done, but by love, by undeserved, unconditional love that God showed me. He changed me. I merely listened and made a choice to do what he was saying. I learned that sometimes the littlest things have the biggest impact. Looking back on all my life and the days leading up to that life-changing moment, I no, every moment, thought, and situation was preparing my heart to follow the Lord on a path of redemption out of darkness and into light. After letting my heart be made whole again, I experienced a deep sense of longing and drive for holiness to learn more and to live my life according to God's principles. I submitted my life to Christ and prayed that God would show his love through me, starting with the people that were closest in my family so that my life would be a reflection of his love. 1 John 4, 8 through 12 says, Anyone who does not know love does not know God, because God is love. How did God show his love for us? He sent his one and only son into the world. He sent him so we could receive life through him. What is love? It is not that we loved God, it is that he loved us and sent his son to give his life to pay for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us so much, we should also love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And through me, God would draw them closer to him. I saw transformation after transformation as God worked in our lives. I stand here before God and before you to make a promise, to never let that fire burn out, to never return to darkness, to do God's will all the days of my life, and to someday be worthy enough through Christ that I can stand in the presence of my Father. Amen. Amen. As we're, as we're coming up, as Aaron and Carrie are coming up, if maybe you're feeling inspired, you'd like to do this, we'd love to do this again. Let me know. We've got a couple of people who've talked about becoming members, and that'll be the next process. As they want to do that, we'll do that. And we've got one for sure who's expressed uh, that she wants to be a member, and we'll be knocking those things out here in the weeks to come. Um, baptism is one of the requirements to be a member here at Glory Baptist Church. And so uh, I figured we'd wait till they got baptized, and if they wanted to join, they can join. If not, then when they're ready, they'll join. But if somebody's here today wants to join, wants to become a member, let myself or one of the deacons know, and uh, we'll get that taken care of as well. So, who wants to go first? Aaron? Come on up. You need help in there, Aaron? <laughs> they said not to dive in there. Is that Aaron? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just as a bit of background, a little less than a year ago, Aaron was still in Afghanistan serving our country. So, mm -hmm. so we are thankful for his time serving. I thought it was September. Fourteen, so two years ago. Sorry, two years ago. I thought it was a year ago. Okay, sorry. Um, but he has served our country well, and we are thankful for your service. We always want to recognize you for that, and uh, we're thankful that you're here with us today. Uh, so just so we're clear, you've taken and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Alright, you want to just kneel down, I can sit down. I'm going to make you all the way up to the wall. Hard to do in the pool. 
joy. It is with honor that I get this beautiful opportunity to baptize Aaron Moss in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. As many who have come before him and many who will come after him, we baptize you today, Aaron. Let us go. <laughs> song, just one, the first verse of Amazing Grace. If you will join our praise team as we sing the first verse. We have it over here. Oh, do you? Just come join us. <laughs> you got it. Okay, got it. Sing with us. Serve your king and rejoice. Amen. 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 